Thank you for coming here. This is real world serverless, as if serverless was anything but real world. Um, I can't see anything, so if there are any questions, you have to scream, okay? Because the slide is blinding me all the way. Um, who am I? I'm David. I'm from Germany, Düsseldorf, best town in Germany, I guess. Uh, I work for a consultancy, Zenacore Technologies. We do not do business in Switzerland, I guess. We are only in Austria and Germany, so you might not know us. Um, we do technical stuff for insurance companies and then financial industries, stuff like this. And you can find me under my uh, label König Hotze on Twitter, GitHub and uh, PlayStation if you want to play FIFA. Okay, befo before we start, I want to know who you are. So four questions. Um, who is actually building microservices? Whoa, it's 30% in production. <laughs> And who's using containers? Docker, or if there's, oh, more than the microservice guys. So, cool. Is anybody running on a cloud, public or uh, on-premise? Anything other but OpenShift? <laughs> Couple of hands, I uh, thought so. And is anybody experienced with serverless? Okay, just two hands, that's good, because nobody can tell if I'm lying, great. So um, before we start, um, I'm not a vendor. We will talk a lot about AWS and Amazon. I'm not a vendor. I have no preference whether Azure or Amazon or whatever. I don't care. And um, I'm not a cloud guru. I don't like the term guru. What's a guru? That's some guy who meditates. That's not me. So um, I play around with stuff. I, I apply stuff. But um, everything I say should be taken with a grain of salt. That said, that's a comparison between my experience doing Java and Lambda stuff, serverless. Serverless is the blue part for th those of you who can't see. Uh, it's obvious that this is an emerging technology and um, I think I'm more experienced with classical web applications and instead of serverless. And things are moving fast. Um, if you watch reInvent, AWS reInvent videos, or been to the conference yourself, you will notice that every two weeks everything changes on, on AWS and serverless. So everything I say will be out of date, I guess. What can you expect? Why shouldn't you leave? Um, these are things we've learned when rebuilding an internal application plainly on serverless technologies on AWS. So everything I tell you is pain that we experience. That's why I have gray hair. The business case, it's not so important because we are technicians, we don't care about business, you know. Uh, it, we have an internal application, it's called Employee Administration Platform, and it's built on AD, uh, ASP, uh, ASP.NET and a uh, crazy old um, Microsoft database. And uh, we use it for billing, you know, we are consultancy, builds our business, so um, we use that to generate uh, bis uh, billings based on where you work and for how long. And we sat together as technicians and said, well, let's do serverless. And that was the idea. We have nothing more concrete than that. Let's keep the ASP.NET monolith running on-premise and dying there of old age, and let's build everything else on, on Lambda. Just that you have an idea of, of the complexity of what we are building. And this is work in progress. If you are interested in learning more about the technical details, come to me afterwards, and I will stick around. So. We have to cover some basics. I saw that not everyone here is familiar with serverless, so we have to spend some time there. We will talk about security, because security is really key when you go to the cloud. I think there was a project I've been working on um, which has been shut down because of security. We'll talk about tools. Um, as an architect, I will talk about architecture, I guess. And housekeeping. Housekeeping is equally important in the cloud, and I will tell you why. And even operations, even in the land of serverless, there will be servers. Spoiler alert. And we only have 50 minutes. I was told that I will be shut down hard if I uh, overtake my time. So um, if you have questions and we can't cover everything in that, come to me afterwards, okay? So some basics. Um, AWS Lambda. Uh, I can't really make out anybody of you, so I will just take my experience. Back in the days, um, we worked in such buildings, gray buildings, banking industry, okay? And we were, we were very proud to have our own data center, own machines. Who's working in that environment, by the way? Ah, come on. You're kidding. You're among friends. Yeah, but 
we, we realized that this is a bad approach and we moved to infrastructure as, as a service. The basic idea is that we are not so much interested in, in, in maintaining the actual machines, but rather in abstracting away the hardware and working with virtual machines. It was a good idea, worked great, but it could be improved even further with a platform as a service like uh, Heroku or OpenShift, the old one. And this looks approximately like this. Instead of deploying virtual machines, we deploy applications. Like when you, you deploy to Heroku, you do not uh, exactly deploy a virtual machine. You just wrap your application into something, and they provide the abstraction below. And then we are using containers. I saw that many of you are already using Docker, so you are Docker fans. And we all know Docker is cool. It solves everything we need to know about microservices, unless you start to think about it. And how do you provision all this stuff? What about scaling? Yeah, monitoring? Mm, need tools for that. State and Docker, I think, are good friends. Security yeah, might be needed. And what about deployment and other things? And then there's one big solution. Who can name it? Kubernetes. Awesome. <laughs> we will come to that. This is difficult. And we are using this approach. Okay. How to draw an owl. Who knows? Who can, who can draw an owl? I can't. But there's a, an easy way to do that, and that's the same with distributed the systems. You just start easy. You start with a circle for the head and a circle for, for the body. It's really easy. And then you draw the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Kubernetes does for you. Yeah? You have all these, these basic ideas, and then pop all the rest. And we've been using Kubernetes for quite some time now and quite successfully. It's an awesome tool, but in general, it looks like this. You have two or three guys who know Kubernetes. It's more than just a service YAML, by the way. And they start constructing something. <laughs> and it's awesome. It's, it looks awesome. It looks dangerous also. And, and I will show you now a real slide of an actual Kubernetes architecture we've been working on. It's this. And by the way, if you're a developer, um, that little tiny pod up there. I don't know if you can make it out with some looking glasses. That's what interests you. All the other rest is just whatever. And when I first, first saw that, I reacted like this. I, I no, it's not for me. It's not for me. So this is where serverless enters. The idea is it's serverless, but you can't define something by saying what it's not. Serverless, it's, it's a very bad name. If you look at the documentation, and I will read this no I won't read this um, this is from from AWS from the homepage exactly and I think they, they explain it quite well they say you can do things without thinking about servers there are servers but you don't think about them and you are not required to manually provision them to scale them to manage them to patch them up and you can focus on whatever you are really doing that means the selling point is you can focus on what matters you can ignore everything else and we will we'll see that this is a big lie obviously um, I already told you I will just uh, focus on AWS, but there are others, and there are similar providers like, like Azure Functions, like, like uh, Google Cloud Functions and WebTask, and you even can run this on your Kubernetes if you want to. But we are using AWS because um, they are going to th the moon, I guess, so they are cool. Some basic uh, terms that you have to know. Um, Lambda is just their term for serverless compute. They have, uh, they have ever, um, many other serverless offerings like a database or S3 where you can host your web page. Lambda is basically code that runs. Oops, too fast. S3, who's using Dropbox? Anybody? Yeah, S3 is Dropbox. Easy. <laughs> that means you can store files, objects, whatever. IAM is Identity and Access Management. Just think security. Whenever I say I am, replace it with security. Like back in the days where you had JAWS, only JAWS and good. And then they have CloudFormation, their own way of provisioning um, their infrastructure. Like how do you actually programmatically um, instantiate a new server? Who's using Terraform, by the way? Anybody? Uh, th then you know CloudFormation is just crappy Terraform. Okay. So, but we are talking about Lambda functions. What is this? I don't want to dwell long on this. It's just a piece of code that gets executed for you by an event, triggered by an event, executed and thrown away. It should serve a single purpose, but you can do everything. You can even build your own application in one Lambda if you want to, but in general, one single thing. 
You do not have state. There are some tricks where you can reuse state. I wouldn't recommend it because it makes things difficult. But in general, do not have state. If you want state, go to the database. It supports many runtimes. And um, for example, .NET Core and now Go is also part of the, of, the, of the offering. And those of you who wanted to hear me say, uh, oh, let's do serverless using Java or Kotlin, you can leave now, I guess, because, yeah, <laughs> Node, JavaScript. Why? Um, we tried Java, basically, and we tried Kotlin, but it's just a hassle to bring this thing up in a performance way where it starts fast and, and, and slows down fast. With Node, it's just a given. We are looking at going with Kotlin in the future, but we'll see. But right now, it's just Node and Python, I guess. So some words about the execution model. I already said this, and this is important. Uh, your, your lambda, your, your function, is triggered by an event. It's everything is an event. Be it a, a click on a web page, that might be an event. A, um, some interaction with your mobile device, that's an event. Whatever. And then the lambda calls your actual handler. That's, that's the code. Just think code. And the event source, as I said, can be everything. You are highly exposed. Your lambda function is completely exposed to the environment. And you can get events, without proper protection, of course, from everywhere, even from other lambdas. The code is stored in the Dropbox, in S3. So lifecycle. An event arrives. What happens? The code is in S3. AWS creates a new container, basically something like Docker, I guess. I don't know. Um, they provision that container with your, uh, with your code. And they deploy this to production and, and to the, into the, the live runtime, and they can serve your event. If another event arrives, they can reuse that thing. They don't have to reprovision everything. They just use the, the warm function. And sometime later, they kill it. And that's exactly as I, sp as I said. It's specified as sometime later. You have no control. It can be a second later, 10 seconds later. It doesn't matter. It's up to AWS. Now we have scale by request. Let's say you're really popular. You're a voxed a voting machine on, on the web, maybe, not, not Android. And your service gets called many times. So AWS transparently scales it for you. You have to do nothing, basically. So no more under-provisioning, over-provisioning. You do not have to calculate any spikes. And the best part for your managers, you only pay what you use. Uh, so only when this thing bounces, then you have to pay. Everything else is for free. It can sit around for, for weeks. You only pay what you use. So basics. If you haven't understood the word, eh, your fault. Read it up. There are many books. Frameworks, runtimes, and tools. We all have frameworks. We all have runtimes. We all have tools. Um, and there are many. In the land of service, this is just, I, I think it's four, four months old, that, that snapshot. So I guess there will be 20 more, especially for JavaScript. There are things like, uh, like serverless, which abstract away Lambda. There are things like, like Chalice which does something in a similar way. There's something like Serverless Express where you can wrap an existing application. Blah. We don't need that. You do not need, a, really, you do not need a, a framework to work with AWS. You don't. They, they have an SDK. You apply same practices and you will be fine. And now there's vendor login. Yeah, you say, oh, but then I'm reliant on, on AWS, and what if Amazon breaks down and they go out of business and stuff like this? I guess this is the same discussion. Who is old enough to remember Commons Logging? I think the selling point was that we use Commons Logging, in fact, that when we switch out our logging system. Has anybody ever switched their logging system from Log4j to something else? Yeah, I don't think so. So, but clear engineering practice is something that I want to, to, to imply here, okay? Just separate the Lambda-specific parts from your domain logic. And this is trivial. I'm, I'm ashamed to actually mention this. Um, you always see examples like where you have your handler function that has the, the business logic embedded. And the single most sensible thing is just separate this. Separate the, the Lambda-specific parts from your domain logic insert an anti-corruption layer, that means, I don't know if everybody is familiar with domain-driven design, that just means that the technical stuff on the left-hand side gets separated from your domain logic. On the right-hand side, you have an order, and up here you have some technical events. And you have this abstraction so that your, your basic domain logic is, is clear and, and easy to understand. So if you switched, hypothetically, from AWS to whatever, 
you would just, in the best case, have to rewrite your, your handler, in the best case. But you need tooling for deployment. Um, AWS has an awesome UI. You can do everything in the UI. And for our company, I'm one of the guys responsible for maintaining our accounts there. So this is a pleasure for me. Because everybody likes dialogues like this. This is when the developers click around in AWS and something is missing and AWS will just say, ah, I will add the needed permissions, goodbye. And one week later, I look in the, in the account and I see something like this. I have all these different security policies created. You see this? I can, uh, can you read this? AWS Lambda Basic Execution Role, some crap. Can I delete this stuff? Is this important? Anybody needs this? And you keep cleaning things up. So definitely shut down the UI. Don't use it. Automation is key. And you can use the CLI. Don't read this. It's just an impression of how complex this is. And this is just for creating a basic Hello World function. You can use the AWS CLI. Everything can be done with this. I wouldn't recommend it. It's awful. Think about updates, resources. We go into this later, but just think complex. And then there's Claudia. Mm. For those of you who want to get into this serverless thing, Claudia might be a, a great approach. Claudia makes node deployment really easy. And this is the last time I will talk about Claudia because we don't use it. We found it just irritating. <laughs> because of this stuff, it, it just doesn't scale. We like declarative deployments. I would just like to tell my tooling, this is where I want to end up. I need three functions, scale them with, with whatever, use node, and off you go. And there are two things you can use, in basically, uh, you can use more, but we are using Terraform on the one hand, and this little squirrel up there, Bob the Builder squirrel. I won't go into Terraform because Terraform is awesome. If you just take one thing away from this talk, afterwards, read up on Terraform, use it for everything. So what's the Squirrel? The Squirrel is AWS serverless application model, SAM, meet SAM. It's basically their way of, of declaring some automation for provisioning. It looks like this. Can you read this? I have no idea. I hope so. Um, it's really easy. It's, it's a YAML because uh, YAML is, is cool, I guess. You declare your function, like here. It's a hello world, blah, blah, blah function. You declare the runtime, and you might remember the awful command line. This is the same thing. And then you package it, and you deploy it. CloudFormation is just AWS term for, for provisioning. Uh, that's their, their, their tooling there. You package. You say the template. You don't have to remember all this. I would send the files around. Just a general idea. You package whatever you want to deploy, and then you deploy it. Finished. Totally easy. And it supports rollback. It supports incremental updates whenever something changes. And it can be versioned, you know? Git is a thing, I think. The tools all have different drawbacks. Um, if you work with Sam, like I did now, and something goes wrong, you're in a hell of pain because the logs are totally reversed and awful to read. You have to know your way around. That's the same for Terraform. So there's no, no silver bullet there. I can just share the pain. Choose one of those two, and you will be fine, I guess, until things go south. You will be worried about debugging. What happens if your script is just wrong and breaks down? Good luck finding the reason. Rollback. Um, Terraform supports some way of rolling back to a previous state because it's state management. The same goes for, for um, Sam. But sometimes they just can't and you have to just delete everything and start from new. It's kind of uh, worrying, I think. State management is an issue. What if I provision something and then the next developer provisions also something? Can this state be merged? What happens if somebody uses the UI? All these tools have a different approach and I can't give you a remedy there, so um, you have to live with that. And feature completeness. The, the thing why I said use SAM instead of Terraform was not that I don't like Terraform. I think Terraform is awesome. I will say this 20 times now. But it's feature completeness. SAM is a tool from AWS. And it's obvious that when new features are added to Lambda, then I guess they will be faster available in SAM than in Terraform, because Terraform has always run behind. Cleanliness is next to godliness. This is something my English teacher used to say. I have no idea what this means, but it sounds really smart, I think. Um, those of you who are using cloud platforms might know this tool, Janitor Home, from, from Netflix. It basically looks around in your cloud infrastructure and sees what can be thrown away. Works awesome, use it, just a side note, and test whatever you are doing. 
So this is basic. So, but with Lambda, you remember Lambda needs all this infrastructure, needs an event source, it needs something to write to, it needs to some some context. So you need to integrate right from the start. As a Java developer, you tend to code, 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 maybe push something and then write integration tests. No, with Lambda, you start with the integration test. And this is where Sam Local comes in. You remember Sam, the little squirrel? He has a nice friend. And I, I see that you are writing this down, Sam Local. Um, please add a note, do not use. That's really <laughs> important. <laughs> um, I can tell you why. The next screen actually will say it. It's that. Can you see the number? It's 026. Back in the days when I started my career as a developer, I think production was and testing was really, really important. Now it's just those beta tools. So there are so many bugs. I think it's an awesome eff effort and it's really interesting, but right now I wouldn't recommend it. Just don't use it for, for whatever you're doing because you're wasting time. And I think your testing tools should be as mature as your production tools because you do not want to waste time there. Testing is important. Testing should be stable. So look at it, keep watching it. Maybe it will be one day really feature complete, but right now it's not usable. And on the other end, testing lambdas is just darn easy. You just invoke it. You just, just use AWS Lambda invoke and execute it directly in production. Great idea, yeah? But we have to protect our production, I think. Even in the land of serverless, where we don't have servers and everything is uh, just uh, um, um, fun and giggles, staging is a thing. Um, at least we separate our prod and dev environment. And you might say, well, what? No test environment? No, we don't use a test environment. We don't use a QA environment just to have prod and, and dev. This is the least you should do. And you can do it easily. Remember this, this YAML template, this SAM template. Yeah? We just have to go over here. I hope this camera can track me. Up there, you see the stage parameter. And we just postfix every function that we deploy with the stage. You can also tag it if you want, but we think a clear name is far more easier to distinguish, so you don't have any accidental uh, invokes. Like here, yeah, you see, stage, dev, and we postfix it. Even, even if you do not know the syntax there, I, I think the idea comes, comes across. And then when you deploy it to production, you explicitly overwrite that parameter with production. And you obviously you should have the rights and the good idea to deploy this to production. But even then, that's not enough. Um, most c companies are customers where I go to and they're using AWS or even Azure. I don't care, it's the same thing there. Um, they have one account. They have this, this big insurance company account. And this is a bad idea. Because if I have this big insurance company account, I have to make sure that this uh, developer with the green shirt cannot deploy to production on a per user level. This is really difficult. So separate it. Create different AWS accounts. It's a hassle, it's bureaucracy. You have to provide a different credit card, but I think that's a solvable problem. And if you do it this way, when you deploy, you have to add a profile that you are actually allowed to do this. So not on a per user level, but on an account level. It makes things easier. Do this when you start. Mm. And clean up. I told you about our AWS account, which is a total mess. I think it looked like, look like this big woolly knot. How can you reason about this thing? How do you know what, what, what is important, what isn't? And we've just started. We are, I think we have something around 70 functions running around in production. What if you have 500, how do you know what's important? And the thing is, you need to know what to clean up, what can be removed and what is still uh, useful. And there's this little tool when you start with, with Lambda, this is something I would like to, to uh, really recommend. It helps you with finding whatever is uh, out of date. This is just the output. And this tool will tell you the region where your function is living, even if you do not know about regions, just ignore it. It will tell you the function name. It will tell you when it was last updated and when, when it was last invocated. And you can see this obviously very important test function, which I found. It has been invoked 240 days ago, and uh, I think this is a candidate for removal. And why is this important? It reduces the tech surface. We will come to security later. Um, the more lambdas you expose, the more threats you have to, to fight. 
and the less lambdas you expose, yeah, I guess you, you get it. And you can reason about your cloud infrastructure. I think you can reason about 70 functions maybe, but 6,000, no, no way. It's just a big mess. And you stay in control. You want to stay in control of your, your bill. You want to stay in control of whatever you deploy. You wouldn't allow it in your microservice architecture too, having 400 versions of the same microservice in production. At one time, you will remove things. Same here. Hot and cold. Um, I told you about this cold start, when, when Lambda instantiates your function and it's living in this container. You remember? I guess so. And this happens once, right? Right. Back to our case where we have this user microservice, uh, microservice, uh, serverless application, and an event arrives. Repetition, we create a new container and that thing can serve the event. That's a cold start, right? Another event arrives, check. It's a warm, a warm start, hot start. Easy. But we scale by request. So what happens if there are many events and we have only one warm container? Then that thing can serve the event. But all the other events will be served by cold containers. And I have a picture of my customer who was not so happy with that <laughs> because latency, yeah. Um, this was really unexpected. It might be trivial to, to, to come up with the idea, but for us it was surprising because we thought that this uh, whole cold and warm start would scale better. Cold start will happen for each asynchronous invocation. So if you have 20 lambdas that get invocated at the same time, yeah, it's so trivial when you think about it, but the, when we started we were surprised. So what can you do? You turn to Google, as I always do, or Stack Overflow for that matter, and you ask what can I do? And you find out there is no service level agreement. Amazon has no service level agreement for your lambdas. I will repeat this if you want to. So you have to think about whether or not you move your really important assets to that. Uh, that's to protect their investment, I guess. But nevertheless, no numbers. There are no hard details, just guidelines. Um, and if you look in the internet, you find mysticism and miracles and wizardry in that, that regard. You find four articles, each contradicting. So let's look at a, at a few concepts, like package size. We have some, I see those numbers now, and I'm wondering, what is a 60 MB lambda? Uh, I don't care. Um, we have some lambdas that are quite quite large. We have some lambdas that are quite quite small, 6 MB or, or less. And who thinks that provisioning a runtime with the size has impact, show of hands? Yeah, you're wrong. No impact. Whether it's 100 MB or, or 1 MB, the time for provisioning a, a, a new lambda is basically the same. No, no difference there. What about memory? You can allocate between 182, uh, 28 uh, MBs and I think 3 gigabytes to your Lambda function. We looked at it and you can see what your Lambda actually uses. You see it's max memory used 59 MBs. You deploy it, you run it, and you see there is some correlation. We have no idea why it correlates. We saw some Lambdas with 2 gigs be provisioned faster, some Lambdas with 3 gigs be provisioned slower. So there is some correlation, I guess, but we have not found the algorithm. And Amazon is not, te uh, not telling. What about warm-up ping? Serverless, the framework, supports this out of the box where there is some other lambda that gets triggered every five minutes and it calls your other lambda and tries to keep it warm. Eh, doesn't help. Yeah? You can serve one event, but scale by request, remember? Asynchronous invocation. And in any case, even if you have warm functions, AWS will kill it after a while. They will sit around and after 40 minutes or something like this, they will kill a perfectly warm function, just out of spite, just to make your day miserable, I think. Can't prove it. But keep that in mind. And the only thing I can tell you is you have to measure. Be engineers, measure, change things, measure again. Measure performance. Performance measuring is really important in, in Lambda. Costs money, I know, but it's important. And measure your user experience. If the user can tell from its crappy web interface that's running on some awful framework whether a Lambda function takes 200 milliseconds or two seconds, then why bother? Eh? But if you have a high performance user interface, every second counts. So just measure. I can't give you any other tip. Everything else is just mysticism. And design whatever you're doing, your user interface, your user stories, design with latency in mind. 
don't block your user. Prefer asynchronous invocations to lambdas, always. So security. Who's a security expert in this room? Nobody. Who is concerned with security? <laughs> <laughs> okay. but some people didn't raise their hand, so uh, I'm quite concerned. Uh, want to know whether you're working for my bank. Um, well, nevertheless, serverless is very good for, for security, I guess. Um, and for a good reason, because you don't have any Linux box sitting on the a desk somewhere where some student helper has to patch this manually. This is obviously a good thing. You don't have to care about it. Amazon does. I'm waiting for the day when they screw up and uh, we have some, some awful patch running around for three years, but I think um, my student helpers will screw up earlier than Amazon does. So this is a really good thing. But looking at web applications, you usually use some kind of web application firewall that filters out uh, malicious requests. How do you deploy something like this without a web? Or an application? in that sense, or even a server, so there's no room for our classical tools, right? Right. So we need completely new and adapted coding techniques and, I think, tooling because of the difference in the attack surface. I told you, uh, once again, this is not a complete picture. Everybody can basically call your Lambda. They decide if you know, they want to call you, if they have the permissions. And the good stance is just think everybody is evil, like a psychopath. Everybody wants to harm you. Just think every event source comes with an axe. Okay? That's a clearly sane approach to, to things. Let's talk about event injection. Who has never heard of SQL injection? Good. That used to, to be different a couple of years ago. The idea that somebody gives you um, um, data that is malicious to whatever you're going to execute, like a delete statement embedded in some, some name parameter. And the same holds for, for Lambda. That's uh, what I call a layered cake uh, architecture. This is what we used to build, UI, servers, and persistent with a clear call flow. And at each layer border, we have this validation magic and security magic that maybe Spring Security executes or whatever. But in Lambda, we have no layers. Everybody can call around as a madman, like those homeless dudes in the inner city. And um, those poor guys. Um, but this does not apply to serverless, what we are talking about in layered architectures. So the first thing is never trust your caller, no matter what. You have to basically validate at every Lambda entry point. I don't know if you can read this, um, but even if you could, this is JavaScript, so you wouldn't be able to read it in any case. I try to get the, the meaning across. Um, for every event, try to define the strictest schema possible. Be a complete nut regarding your schema. Like here, we are using Joy. That's just a node framework for, for specifying a, a schema for, for JSON. Really good framework in that sense. We, we define that our event should contain a lambda, which should be a string, an invocation count, which should be a number, and a dry run parameter with a default value. Other frameworks are available. And if the incoming event does not match that, we just reject it. But we do not tell why. Because obviously somebody has called us who has no business calling us. That's really important. Totally easy. You can share this validation, of course, but in general, just think every Lambda must have this as this the first couple of, of, of lines of code. And there's a new thing. It's called billing attack. Why billing attack? Yeah, that's, that's something that actually happens to us. Um, it was a self-inflicted billing attack where we took a thumbnail for of a receipt, started in S3, and we had a same Lambda listing on the same S3 bucket, which triggered itself again. So it was an endless cycle. And I mentioned that we pay for invocation and compute time. Yeah, um, the manager was not so happy. So the only thing, set billing alerts. Avoid surprises. Just say when, when my dev account raises over 50 bucks per, per month, send me an email so it can react and shut things down. And you can automate this, those things, OK? For me, security is like CSS. Once an application is running, you do not take away privileges. It's like a CS CSS file when you join a project. It's this awesome mess of 14,000 lines of garbage, and you want something um, blinking, you just make slash important blink, and off you go. Same for security. 
And there's this principle of least privileges um, where you start slow. You are not allowed anything at the start and you're only given permission step by step. And beware of crappy code examples. Back in the day when I started with Java programming, we had those try catch examples with this empty catch block, just uh, slash slash print uh, exception print stack trace, some, something like this. And most of my guys and, and myself, we applied this, this technique back then, but um, the same is here. There's an actual example from AWS working with IAM. And even if you do not understand IAM, um, I will try to explain it. This thing basically allows every action on every bucket in your account on S3. So basically, go ahead, wreck havoc. It's a basically a tom atom bomb for security. So the thing is, I want to give you is when you're working in the cloud, be prescript uh, prescriptive. Nail it down. In this case, just allow modifications on this particular bucket and just allow read access. Okay. <laughs> Warning sign. Yeah. And um, there are some guys who would recommend security policy sharing. Don't. There's no reason to. Do not share policies. Every Lambda has to get its own secure policy. And, and you say, oh, this, this is really tough, all this YAML file. Yeah, it's tough. Life is tough. So no, no excuses. Like in this example, I will just uh, run through this really quickly. Um, this is an exact example of our, of our production code where we have a role and the function, both in the same file. And up there in the role, we define what the function should be allowed to do. And we refer to that role when we create our function. It's totally easy. So just do it. Don't be um, lazy. And use a security watchdog. Who does security scanning for his jars, third-party dependencies? But this is really, really uh, frightening me. Um, your function may be small, but your dependencies aren't, at least not in JavaScript world. This is an exact example from one of our code um, repositories, where our Lambda function code is just 8K, but we deploy nearly 8 megabytes of dependencies. And I think it's the same in Java world when you, you're using Spring Boot, where you download the internet. There's tools like SNCC which help you with that. Uh, they scan your dependencies. I, I'm not <coughs> recommending SNCC particularly. There are other tools available, but this thing happens to, to be around and it can scan your Lambda functions, scan your, your GitHub repos, whatever. And it will send you a Slack message when a new uh, issue arrives. Really cool. And it's free for open source projects. And there's also this PureSec CLI, um, which I won't cover much because it's based on serverless. It can scan your code and create the, ro the most restrictive role needed for this code. Totally awesome. I'm waiting for uh, uh, something like this for plain um, lambdas. So security must be part of your development right from the start, not an afterthought. And I would like to change this thing. Instead of you build it, you run it. It should be you build it, you secure it, and then only then you run it. This should be your mantra. So moving fast to architectures and traps. Um, beware of killing everything in your backyard. Uh, we had this case where Lambda scales by request. But at least my backends do not scale by request. We bought three machines. They are sitting somewhere, and that's the, their scalability, basically. So we had this case where we submit billings that we received from the outside world to our billing API, a backend server. It could be a um, database in the same sense. It looks like this, uh, where we have a Lambda in front of our billing API for reasons, and we just use it. And at the end of the month, when all the consultants come home to their hometown and they want to submit their receipts, it looks like this. And then the guys that are responsible for this billing API, they called us. It looked like this. They put us to the stake, burned us down, and asked us to stop. But we needed Lambda for our CVs, so uh, we had to find a common ground. Use concurrency limits. Use throttling. It's so easy. Just use something like this, where you tell Lambda, don't scale to 1,000 or whatever, just scale to 10. My database can handle 10 concurrent accesses. Just throttle down. And keep an eye on whether or not this concurrency limit is actually lower than expected. You can watch this. I can t show you afterwards. I have no time for it to show you all the monitoring tools. Come to me afterwards. But be aware that those bottlenecks you put below on an API, they tend to spread. They tend to, to move up the layer. And then you have a bottleneck in the next layer. And then la la. And 
and upwards. So I said this initially, prefer asynchronous integrations. When you call your backend API, maybe you're able to put a queue in between and, and, and use throttling in that sense. And then there's this attack of self-denial. <coughs> we have this rather often where concurrency is limited. And this was also new. Everything is documented, by the way, but uh, you have to find the documentation. There are account limits. Um, and there, as I said, they are documented. It's written right here. In your account, 1,000 Lambda invocations can happen in parallel, which sounds like a lot, but you have a big insurance company in Germany with many departments, many developers, many uh, stuff happening at the same time. 1,000 is nothing. So I will, I will scale it down to, um, let's say it was four instead of thousand. Then we have this user, which is popular. It gets four invocations. It can serve this. And then there's uh, our budget service, which gets one invocation and uh, <coughs> has to wait. Can be remedied by using accounts. What we ended up is we split the accounts per bounded context. We say there's a user account, there's a project account, there's a budget account. Nothing to do with, with technology, just administration, but it helps you to keep things separate so that things can move along without inflicting pain on other teams. Just quickly, some patterns. Um, we have three patterns that we are using for migrating to uh, Lambda. I think this is the most important part to take away with you. Uh, one Lambda with a dispatch, multi-Lambda with shared code, and multi-Lambda with shared nothing. Let's just quickly look at one Lambda with dispatch. The idea is, Let's say you have a, a web application, you want to bring it into serverless. Like you say, oh, serverless sounds good, let's try it tomorrow. I think that's the way you start. You just put a lambda in front of your, your existing application and call it this way. Totally easy. Totally easy of transitioning, but keep in mind you are deploying a big monolith. That means the security has to cover the whole application. You have just one lambda, so lambda has to be able to do everything. Sizing might be a problem, so you have to assign lots of memory to that thing. But deployment is easy, and you can say you have serverless in your um, CV once again. Then there's multi-lambda. That's the next step. That's where actually most of our code is right now. We have this, this order, once again, this order example with the create order, forward order, and cancel order. And you deploy the same archive multiple times with, with a lambda in front of it. And as you can see, each lambda is just responsible for a single uh, functionality in that, in that, in that um, archive. That's a good way of getting started with this. It's a good way of, of bringing some flexibility with regards to security to, to sizing and to, to, to deployment, I guess. And it reduces the complexity for adopting things. But be aware that, once again, security, you are deploying lots of stuff into production, which has no business of being there. And the holy grail where you want to be is this multi-lambda. Once again, your existing application and you refactor. That means you split it really up. That takes effort, you have to do this, you have to do this constantly, and each gets its own lambda. So this is the holy grail, I, I would say, where you actually adopt all the advantages of lambda, but you have to t be aware of complexity and uh, the ease of transitioning might hurt. But at the end, um, instead of car caring about security and rollout there, we care about security and rollout there, so I think the advantages are clear. So um, there are many other topics which I have skipped now because uh, I was threatened that somebody will plug out my, my laptop. I am part of the serverless hype train. Um, I think this is the way to go. And if you, I realize that you have no experience with serverless in the broad sense, adopt it. Buy a book, try it out now. There's no big um, hurdle there. If you're running on Kubernetes, you can use things like Fission which is a serverless framework run for running on Kubernetes, which is not production ready, but you can adopt some techniques there. Um, try it out. I think that's the future. It won't look like this, obviously. And even with serverless, designing systems is still hard. Things like security, like, like, like consistency, they don't go away just by another tooling. They are just hidden behind a different layer. The challenges are just different, but the same. And do not start with AWS and with Lambda, whatever, without a cloud-savvy guy. Um, when I mean DevOps, I do not mean a DevOps team in a different building. I mean there is somebody who takes care of ops in your team. I know managers always confuse that. Let's hire a DevOps team. Um, that's not going to work, not for Lambda. We've come from a project where the setup was like this. Okay, it was not DevOps, it was cloud ops. 
but it was a mess nevertheless. This is DevOpsec done right, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I showed you this picture before. Yeah, we care about things upfront, not at the end of the project. And tooling, be aware that this tooling is evolving. It changes every week. Everything is just better. It's just maybe alpha. Everything breaks down all the time. So be aware for a hell of pain. Things improve, but not as fast as I would like to. And this is might be a surprise. This is not a silver bullet. And a VM is sometimes definitely enough, as is Docker. So you don't have to do serverless because everybody else is doing it. So instead of serverless, I would rather use this term, less servers that we need to ca take care of, uh, but I think that's bad from a marketing perspective, I think. So um, this was a quick run to of what we are doing with um, serverless and some of the things that we found out. Um, thank you for listening. Questions, feedback, positive feedback, please. I don't want to criticism. Um, if you have any questions, I stay around and I can show you more examples, more in depth. No questions? That's great. Thank you. Have a nice conference.